Hey, Pioneers, welcome to episode number 394. On today's episode, we're going to be diving into electric fencing options, including poultry netting different ways that you can use that versatility with different types of livestock and making sure that you are getting the best from your poultry netting, how to manage that so that it has a longer lifespan is also effective and some tips for how to set it up so that not only is it effective at doing its job at keeping those predators at bay, but also knowing how to best set it up depending upon the type of predator that you have in your area. You'll hear in today's episode where I share about how I first discovered poultry netting, why it is so nice to have as an option, especially if you live in an area that has a high predator pressure, like we do, it's been the only way that I have been able to offer my poultry, both our ducks and our chicken chickens, the largest amount of ranging area without losing an entire flock overnight when I tried to just fully free range. So I feel like this gives the best life, both expectancy and longevity range to the poultry, but also their quality of life by including and using the poultry netting. So really excited to talk about this today, because even though I've been using poultry netting myself for three years, there is some tips that I gleaned from today's episode that's going to help me use it better and increase the longevity of said poultry netting. So we will definitely be talking about poultry netting, but also talking about when you are picking to purchase your energizers, which is what energizes and makes your electric fence electric, like things to consider when you're looking at the output of different energizers and which one to get started with. If you're uh, going solar routes, etc., some expectancies on how long the batteries are going to use best ways practices so that you don't run that battery down out really fast. Um, all of those types of things we're covering into today's episode. So if you have livestock or you plan on getting livestock, and using any type of electric fencing, including the solar electric fencing, you are going to love today's episode, which is sponsored by Premier One Supplies. So let's get straight to it. Well, hey, Joe, welcome to the Pioneering Today podcast. Well, thank you, Melissa. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm really excited to have you on. It's funny, we've gotten to chat a lot of time in person and mm -hmm quite a few emails back and forth, but, oh, yeah. and I've, and I've talked about premier one as a sponsor mm -hmm. of the podcast a lot of times, but it's your first time coming on and I'm really excited. Cause I actually have some questions to pick your brain on, oh, and, right. That's always fun. And always. I've got a lot of reader questions on fencing as well. So I'm excited to talk to you. One, I, th I think this is really cool because I don't think that we see this a lot with and I know this is like a relative term, right? To call a company large or not, like what actually constitute to each person, that's probably going to yeah. be something a little bit different. But what I would say is a, a well-established large-ish company, okay. um, but that you guys actually have, and I'll let you explain this more, but you mm -hmm. guys actually have a working farm where your fencing products are being used and tested as a company. So kind of walk me through what what that looks like, because I think that's really cool. Yeah, um, it, we, I guess Premier kind of stumbled into being a company because our owner and founder, Stan Potratz, he um, he went to college off in England for a couple of years after high school and then ran a farm there. And then when he came back to the home farm in Iowa, he wanted to use the tools that he used in England. He wanted to raise sheep the way he did there, but it was not being done that way here. So he imported like handling equipment, electrified netting, brought that in and then saw that there's kind of a market potential there. So this, you know, farm get out of Iowa. It's like, you know what? I'll see if I can sell this netting. Um, and then 45, 50 years later, uh, we've got 60 employees and we're sell a little bit more than just sheep netting now <laughs> and uh, kind of expanded our product line. But he, he did all this so he could uh, raise sheep on his home farm. So that's what we do. We uh, we have about 800 head of ewes out there, and there's about 40 or 60 goats, and then a couple different poultry flocks. And we've expanded the acreage just so we can make more baleage, make more hay, and just graze more area than the original farm. So it's premieres allowed, just kind of allowed the farm to grow. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, and, that's awesome. 
that's yeah. that's quite a few animals. Yeah. 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 Not not quite as big as the Western Range folks, sheep flock wise, but for Iowa, that's a good size sheep flock. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because when it comes to fencing, I I grew up on a, a cattle farm, so we mm-hmm. always had you know your standard barbed wire fencing and it was Mm -hmm. a mixture of fence posts and sometimes tree like if a tree was growing an evergreen tree was growing right where you you know boom it became a fence post all on its own and then some metal t-posts etc and really my dad for gates he would just take your barbed wire and some smaller wooden posts and the gates were just this barbed wire you know like with three posts in the center that you just open and then redo so we didn't even have like your metal swing gates or anything like that and he he grew up in a time I should say he grew up during, he was born in the 1930s Mm -hmm. and they always raised their own food, lived on a a farm and a homestead, but they didn't have electricity at their house. Of course. And I don't even know if electric fencing was used at all back then, to be honest, in the thirties, forties, I really know. I know. Right. I'm like, I don't actually know when electric fencing kind of started, Mm -hmm. but so he, we never used electric fencing growing up. It was always just barbed wire. And for the cows, you know, he was doing pretty big, well, decently sized acreage, not anything like huge ranches, like in the Midwest, but for out here about a hundred acres. So it was just, you know, barbed wire fencing. And then I got into horses. <laughs> and so of course we got horses and that's where I started to learn about electric fencing. We would just use a single wire on the inside of the barbed wire of the electric fencing, because horses are much more accident prone than <laughs> cattle. And yeah. so after having to doctor the horse, after it would get, you know, in the barbed wire quickly learned, okay, we're going to put up this electric fencing to protect the horse and help mitigate, hopefully uh, injury and also vet bills. But that was really my extent of different fencing because my primary experience was just fencing with either cattle or horses until we started to raise a lot more of our own livestock. And we got into the chickens and into the pigs um, and all of that and realized you really need to use electric fencing with pigs if you want to keep them in any specific space for an amount of time. Mm -hmm. Tried goats. Goats Mm -hmm. were not for me. (laughs) <laughs> Amen. Leave that there. Uh, but that was really due to fencing because the goats kept getting out of every manner of fence that we tried to put them in and damaging things. And so I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm done with the goats mm-hmm. and we haven't went back to goats. But I first realized, honestly, it was when we went to one of the conferences about the poultry netting. And I was very intrigued to be able to use netting that was electric Mm-hmm. but I was a little bit hesitant because it was solar. Honestly, here in the Pacific Northwest where we are, we're so gray oh, all yeah. the time. And I just wasn't sure, like, is it actually going to stay energized, especially in our winter months when we go, you know, our, our, I laugh and air quote daylight hours, because <laughs> we don't really get a whole lot of daylight. It feels like it's just that real gloomy cloud cover and we'll get daylight at about 9 30 in the middle of winter where I am, it feels like the sun kind of really start or the light really starts to come up over the mountain range. And then by 4 30 in the afternoon, we're dark again, mm. uh, you know, right around December when you're, you're at shortest days of the year. Yeah. So I was like, I don't know how, if this is going to stay energized, if it's going to work all winter for us, mm-hmm. but I'm like, well, let's test it. Cause there's no, but you know, let's just test it and see. And I, I remember the first year we used it. Like I was shocked. I'm like, I can't believe this thing. Like it stayed energized the whole time worked extremely well. And it was the only way that I've been able to sec- successfully keep our chickens from getting killed by the coyotes mm-hmm. um, and giving them more space than what, that's just what in the chicken tractor. Cause prior we were using the chicken, tra- chicken tractor so we could move them around the yard after we realized free range just means free range dinner for all the coyotes. And I will have, I went from a flock of 20 to one in yeah. two days time, like when we were just total free ranging. So it's, I feel like it's given me the best of both worlds for the chickens because it enlarges their space area, but it also keeps them very safe. It lets me do more effective pasture management with them um, Mm -hmm. and with, with our ducks. So I love the poultry netting, Um, but I've also had people ask and really our main predators here Mm -hmm. are raccoons and coyotes Mm -hmm. and coyotes are the biggest predator pressure for us when it comes to our chickens. We do have cougar and occasionally black bear in our area, but I've honestly never like had them in my fields. I don't know of anybody around here who has had black bears attack their livestock or get into coops or anything like that. We have probably more issues with cougar um, with some of the bigger livestock, but not with the chickens uh, thus far. So Mm -hmm. my question is with the poultry netting, 
what have you guys found as far as different predators? Does it tend to work really well with her? Is there any that it, I mean, obviously aerial predators, they can just fly yeah. right over it. So that, but aside from that, any four-legged, two-legged critters, um, is there any that have you found that kind of just go through it? They don't care, or does it protect pretty well against mm -hmm. your major predator forces? I'm going to say for the majority of those predators you listed, it covers it. Um, one you didn't mention was weasels. They, I've had folks that say poultry mitten net does work for it okay. and I have other, but we, we, we don't recommend it that way. Uh, the, the key there is that you've got a very high output energizer that weasel is making poor contact to the fence. So if you're overcoming that lack of circuit conductivity, you can probably get it, but they're also small because that's why we go with like half inch or less hardware cloth because they can't fit through that, but the spacings on poultry nets, two by two, three by three range. So I don't tell folks that it works for weasels. I have folks that say it does, but at coming out of Premier, we're not recommending it, recommending against weasels. So you've got to also have a good stout coop on that side of things. Um, I wish I didn't say that out the gate, but that's okay. Uh, aerial predators, we like to set up narrow runs. That cuts down on the bird's ability to swoop in. So you still have a long, narrow run, but it reduces the angle of attack for your um, primary pred aerial predators. Okay. So instead of putting it more in like a big round circle, yeah, just make it long and skinny. Narrower. Yeah. Okay. Cuts down. Yep. Okay. Then, then, I'll, then when it's long and skinny, crisscross fishing line or something a little bit, bit bigger, like thicker, like a monofilament, um, have people that have done reflective tape just to get in the way of the bird. So they're very hesitant to go in there because they don't know, they, can, they are not exactly sure what they're flying into. They don't know if they can get out. So that helps. Okay. Um, one is bobcat, and we've had issues with that in the past. And what we found is that if you angle your net outward, rather than having a nice straight up and down, if you angle mm -hmm. it towards the predator, when they first come up to that fence, they're gonna touch the fence, get a shock, they're gonna look at it, look up, and they're gonna see more of that thing that shocked them. And they're gonna learn to stay away. If it's just straight up and down, they're gonna look up and see sky and go, well, I can jump that. So we're just kind of playing with their brain a little bit there. Uh, cougar, <laughs> uh, I've been fortunate in Iowa that um, they're not too common here. Uh, you usually hear about them during deer season or some game camera. Someone says that they found them, but uh, I haven't ex seen them. Bobcats, yes, but I would probably still do the angled outward okay. method for the cougar, pumas, mountain lions. But um, I would also realize that I've got a very unique predator to work with here. So maybe go with taller fencing at that point. So rather than the 48 inch poultry netting, uh, maybe add in a couple multi-strand like deer height style fences just around there, just to add okay. some upper strands that, that even though say the cougar is gonna jump them, they don't know how an electric circuit works the way we do. So if, it, if the animal's up in the air, they're not going to get a shock when they touch the wire because they're not grounded. They don't know that. We do. So uh, just play with their brains a little bit there. Um, you mentioned black bear, mm -hmm. and people think that they're this big, ferocious animal. Well, they are, but they're often heavier than a human is, so they make excellent, and they don't wear shoes, so they make excellent contact to the ground. So the way an electric fence works is... Pulse comes down the fence from the energizer. You or I or the animal touches it. Shock goes through you into the ground, back to the ground rod of the energizer. And like say heavier you are or less insulated you are, you make better contact. So you, you make a better circuit. Bears, they're not wearing shoes. They don't have a lot of insulation on their feet. So when they touch a fence, they're going to get a good shock because they're a big animal. Whereas like a chicken, they're not going to get as much of a shock. So they're a smaller because um, they're smaller. So it's kind of the inverse of what people think is when uh, we're right now we're doing some advertisements for poultry and a common question is, well, how is this not fry the chickens? Because it's meant for a bowl, right? You need more power for a bowl. You no, know, chicken's going to kind of the opposite or the bear is going to tear right through that if it's just strong enough for a chicken. It's the opposite. So that's just interesting, interesting thing you learn. <laughs> Um, working with the fence. So yeah, we, we use it for bear. Well, 
not in Iowa, but we have a lot of folks in the Northeast, Southeast, uh, Northwest. We have folks that take uh, small sections of it camping with them just to put around their campsite to keep bear away. Uh, a lot of folks with beehives in bear country. Yep. Oh, that's a good idea. I hadn't actually oh, yeah. thought of that application. So yeah. we, I shouldn't even say this publicly. We're flirting with the idea of getting into bees, but <laughs> I'm not oh. quite ready. I'm not quite ready to make the plunge just because I know at this moment in my life, um, I don't have the capacity to fully jump into anything new yet, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a, a goal for the future is probably a better way of putting that. And so yeah. that is an excellent thing to consider mm -hmm. in order to keep, yeah, okay. to keep the predators out. Uh, just started my first hive this year. So they normally tell you to have two, that way you can compare them. Say, is this one doing well? Is this not doing well? I did it wrong. I just jumped in, got one hive. Well, they seem to be doing well. <laughs> right. We always have the best, right? There's always the advice, like what, you know, what they say to do. Yeah. And then there's, there's what we end up doing. And oh, yeah. Yeah. very often they're, they're not exactly coinciding there. So I'm, I'm laughing because I, I tend to do projects that way too. Oh, um, absolutely. How and else are you do them? Yeah. And, and be a, a learner the hard way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Learning is fun, whether it's easy or hard, it's still fun. It is yeah. very fun. Yeah. So with the fencing, I think because like I said, electric fencing wasn't really something that I saw managed very mm -hmm. much and then started learning about it and, and seeing how different people were using mm -hmm. All the different kinds of electric fencing beyond just what I, you know, knew as a rate, like I know, a, a fencer that you plugged in. And usually it was like a single wire. Sometimes it's a two strand wire, like with the pigs, we'd put one down really low at like snout level, of yeah. course, uh, you know, that type of thing. But then when I started to learn about mob grazing, I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, we really need to have electric fencing to do mob grazing effectively. Cause I don't know how on earth anybody would do it without when you're trying to move, you know, sections that often, it just doesn't yeah. make sense for to do any other way. Um, and so the, that's when, uh, we got the reels and stuff from you guys. Cause I had never mm -hmm. actually seen, uh, seen them done that way. Cause I'd not, most people were just putting them up as stationary. Like I'd seen mm -hmm. electric fences done as stationary. And so the mob grazing has been really great and effective, but I also realized when we first got started getting the, the netting and I have uh, one flock that we keep separate and separate. And then we have the meat birds that we keep separate. And then now I have ducks that we keep separate um, and getting the energizers for some of those different ones. Cause they're just too far apart to be able to connect together in any shape or form. And then we purchased uh, the 40 acre farm just a year ago, a few days ago, it's been a year, 40 acre farm down the road from us. So that has its own whole setup now. Cause it has different herds down there as well. And so I realized for a lot of people just getting started with fencing, you know, getting started with homesteading and getting started with livestock is an expense all, you know, all of its own. And then you start to add in the different fencing. So is there one type of the fencing that you feel is a little bit more universal? So say if you, you're only going to, mm -hmm. you know, you want to get some fencing that would work if you've got, maybe you're going to do pigs and you're going to do chickens mm -hmm. and maybe something of the smaller livestock, like goats or sheep. Um, that type of thing. Do you feel like there's one that, that kind of is universal and can get you started or is it really more specific reasons that each mm -hmm. one is better suited to a specific type of livestock? There's it's, it's an, it depends and yes and no to both of that. Um, so if you want something that's the most universal, I'd go with poultry netting because it's got the height. Uh, it's a four foot tall fence. So that's going to cover you know, your sheep, your chickens, your goats, your swine, your cattle. It's overkill for cattle, but it works because they'll still get a shock. There's way more strands because you can do a cattle with one or two strands, as you mentioned. But if you don't have any existing fence and you want to run some other animals in there, it's a good option. Uh, so it's tight enough for poultry. It's tight enough for goats. Swine, I've, I've worked with swine in poultry netting. It works, but... The reason why we get pigs and put them outside is because they like to root and turn up the soil. That they taste good now, but so when they root and turn up that soil, they'll often bury the bottom bottom electrified strands with that net, and that shorts out your fence. So then you have no charge running through your fence, and the hog goes through the fence. So we have to be vigilant or um, do chores every day, shall we say, and check your fence to make sure those bottom strands aren't shorted out. And it's just a 
turn off the unit or energizer, kick the clods off, kick them further into further into the hog lot, and um, turn your fence back on, and you should be good to go. Okay. So, now with with the poultry netting, how many sets can you string together mm-hmm. before you're going to lose, you know, start to lose voltage? I guess. I'm- Excellent question. So. When you're setting up multiple strands of poultry net, you want to make sure you have an energizer with enough output to power that number of strands. So if you so if you go to a farm store or look at our website, you'll see um, different cost units, and that's based primarily based on their output. So an energizer with more output can run more fence. So uh, a typical solar unit's in like the 0. 0.5, 0. 0.8 joule range, and that'll do about Oh, 300, 400 feet of poultry netting, depending on your location, depending on your grass contact on the fence. If you go with a one joule unit, well, you can get, you know, probably five, six strands of poultry netting out of that. It, it's So it's kind of, it depends um, how many strands. Um, we have some 20 joule units or higher used at the Premier Farms, and we can get a lot of net on those units. So we can do a larger area. Uh, and I mentioned, I will probably come up i mentioned grass contact just now yeah so when those little green strands um or things growing out of the ground we're, we're kind of in a drought in iowa right now so green is kind of half an anomaly um uh when you have grass contact on your fence each little blade of grass it's not the most conductive thing in the world where you and i are more conductive than a blade of grass but it's it doesn't take a lot of power from the fence, but when you have grass contact, you have a lot of little blades of grass or forage contacting those strands. So it's cumulative throughout the entire fence line. So they will sap a little bit of energy from your fence, but by the time you get to the end of your fence line, that's taken a lot of the voltage or power out of your fence. So what I like to do is mow ahead of time, trample the grass down. That way I don't have any contact on my fence and also just have a unit with enough output to power the quantity of net I want, like based on uh, what a, whatever charts or ratings say, and then maybe go the next size up because I know I'm going to have grass contact just the way I manage things on my farm. But, all right, I, w- I want a little, um, oh, make myself feel better here, <laughs> like a little mental, um, uh, less anxiety, there we go. Uh, not the right word, but we'll get there one of these days. Uh, yeah. Well, no, that's a good question because we we get a lot. We have a lot of we do have grass in the pasture, but then sometimes they'll be trying to put the animals that they'll graze where we've got a little bit of brush that's trying to encroach in, you mm-hmm. know, kind of where the forest meets the pasture to keep that down. Mm-hmm. And so that it's funny. I always feel like whenever we have bought any type of energizer, mm-hmm. It never fails that down the road, you decide you need to add more fence or there's more contact, like you're saying, especially Mm -hmm. in uh, spring and fall summer, we can get drought drought here too Mm -hmm. in certain areas and parts of the pasture will just die down and and there's really nothing there. So it's not a big issue, but for the most part of the year. And so now we're like, okay, what's the biggest one that they sell (laughs) the most output? Cause that's the one we're going for. (laughs) So I feel like we finally learned that instead of always, you know, just trying to balance that. So Mm -hmm. we got the one that was like triple uh, what we estimated we would need down at, at the new farm state. Plus it's much larger acreage than we're used to, yeah. to having here. But yeah, I, I felt like we finally learned our lesson mm-hmm. um, and put that into use of going bigger with the electric needs. Cause I've never been like, Oh man, I, you know, that was really overkill. Like I've always, you know, just a little bit down the road, wish they would want with the larger one. So I guess that's a moral of this story mm-hmm. Go for the little bit larger output than you think you're going to need. Yeah. You, you don't have to be like orders of magnitude larger because um, I'll read, hear a lot of comments like, oh, I, I was told I need at least a three joule or a six joule unit for, for my one roll of fence. Like, oh. no, you, you don't. <laughs> you, you really don't. <laughs> but yeah, and then it just depends how you manage it. So maybe those folks advocating for the higher output units are not mowing ahead of time or they've got tons of grass contact or they have uh, poor conductive soils. So if you're in like a dry area, the ener- the pulse from your energizer when you touch the fence goes through you through the ground back to the ground rod. If you have dry soils, it works a little harder to push that pulse through so you're not going to get as much of a shock. 
So if you have more output to begin with, you can get around that. If you have plenty of grounding, you can get around that. If you run what's called a pause and egg fence, which is half your strands are connected to the energizer per normal, the other half are connected to your ground rod directly. So they're insulated from one another. And when an animal touches both of those strands, a positive and negative strand, they get the shock and they don't have to rely on the soil moisture to carry any pulse. So in dry, rocky areas, those are good fences to have or in dry Iowa at the moment, but uh, not quite that dry at home, but things yeah. to think about. There's a lot to think about yeah. when you're when, playing with plants. Yeah. And I, I'm glad you bring that up because weather and, and climate, so obviously different times of year can affect mm -hmm. how things operate differently too. Mm -hmm. um, but also overall, so for us in the winter climate mm -hmm. here, I'm in Northern Western Washington. So we're on the West side of the cascade. So I don't get as cold or as much snow as the East side of Washington state, or even as Idaho does. So we really are, are flirting with a lot of cold rain and usually a lot of moisture, very dry summers. Mm -hmm. But when we do get snow, usually I have fairly wet and heavy snow. Sometimes mm -hmm. we'll get a snowstorm that will come in and it'll be real dry and light and fluffy and we'll get like mm -hmm. two feet. Um, but then in like three days time, it'll start to warm up. And then of course it starts to melt. It just becomes this hideous, soggy mm -hmm. ugh, mess. So with the poultry netting, is there kind of like a, a general rule of thumb on how much snow um, it can handle? Like is it in danger if you get too much snow and it's like pushing on it, like that something's going to break or, or damage it, like that you shouldn't have it up during certain winter conditions or that it's just going to be ineffective or kind of, kind of walk me through that winter management when you're getting a large accumulation of snow. Well, during the winter months, you're probably not uh, rotationally grazing at that point in time. So for many of you, that's going to be put away during that season. Um, I've left mine up at home the last few winters in Iowa, and we get have gotten some, you know, you know, a foot of snow or six to ten inches at a time, and it, it varies what kind of snow we get. We get the powdery kind, we get the wet slushy kind. Um, the powdery snows, the dry powdery snows, they kind of act as an insulator. So if an animal touches that fence and they are kind of on the drier type of snow, that pulse power is not going to be able really be able to get through them. If it's a wet slushy snow and they touch it, and if say if it's only an inch or so, they they should get a shock because there's all that available moisture there. But if that wet slushy snow is touching those lower conductors, you're probably shorting out your fence because now there's a cannot contact to ground. So winter use and poultry netting um, is probably just more of a psychological barrier at that time. If you have that snow cover, if you um, say take up your fence, clear the snow away and then drill some holes in that frozen ground, put your spikes back in the ground. Um, you might, you, it'll probably work for you until you get the next snow again. So there's just okay. a different management if you want to use it. Um, me, I left mine up all year round and just run a door, an automatic door on my coop so the birds can range during the day and go back in at night. It's shut and they're just kind of half contained by that netting at that point. Okay. Which that's great. And I'm, Yes. I'm not rotating them once the grass is quit growing and, mm -hmm. and is covered, you know, usually with light snow, but um, it's still for predator pressure because the yeah. coyotes here don't really ever go away. And mm -hmm. I hate leaving them in just the tractor space for all winter, yeah. even though I, I do really deep, mm -hmm. um, hay, uh, not hay straw bedding for them. So they've got that deep litter. Yeah. Deep bedding and all of that, but still, I mean, your tractor is only so big, of, you know, big of a space. So I keep the netting up so that same thing, like at night they'll go in, of course, cause that's yep. where all their bedding is and I keep their food and their water, et cetera. And then they like to come out within the netting area. And I was, I've shared with some of the listeners of the, of the podcast, but we got ducks last year and I fell in love with raising ducks in our climate. I've never had anything go after the slugs because our chickens mm -hmm. here, they don't touch slugs or snails. They're like, oh. they don't, they don't eat them at all, mm -hmm. but the ducks love the slugs. And so it was the first year I had no slug issues and I could keep the ducks in the garden, even when it was growing, because they didn't damage the garden plants. Like the chickens did The chickens oh. are so destructive in the vegetable garden. You know, they're scratching everything up and they just tend to eat everything. And the ducks would just kind of do a pass through. They'd grab mm -hmm. the slugs and then they would go on their way. They weren't you know, tearing up roots and uprooting plants and yeah. 
eating all of my ripe tomatoes. I yes. still have a grudge against my chickens. They like my tomatoes and strawberries as much as I do and usually beat me to them when they're free ranging. Yeah, so, mine move my mulch. Stop. Yes. I've, I've actually had the dust bath under some of my berry plants. And because it was in the middle of summer and they're more shallow rooted, they exposed the roots so much that they killed them because they oh. got so dry. Like the root, anyways. So I have a love hate with my chickens, but oh. I love the ducks. Anyhow, so we had the ducks in a separate area than the chickens. We just had them raised separate, separate tractors, separate area of the farm. And it got it to be in the middle of winter and they did not like the deep snow, bless their hearts. Mm-hmm. So once the snow had started to melt, they had gotten so sick of being in the tractor that I was having a hard time getting them to come back in the netting at night and into the tractor itself. So I got kind of lazy, to be honest, because I was cold and I did. I got tired of chasing them around the yard, to be honest, at night to try to get them back in. I'm like, fine, stay out. Like you do your thing. Mm -hmm. Well, that was good for about three nights. And then they were right outside our back door and they had laid their eggs. And that was the other beautiful thing is they would lay their eggs all winter for me without any, any, and I don't supplement our chicken coop. So I didn't get any eggs during the middle mm-hmm. of winter, but the ducks kept right on laying. So they laid their eggs at about five in the morning is when they would lay five, six in the morning. And then we got up at like seven o'clock in the morning. So from the time they had laid their eggs and when we got up, something came in and got all six of the ducks and there was no, um, you know, carcasses or feathers. So we're not really sure what got them. I don't think it was an aerial predator just because I don't see how one owl could have taken mm-hmm. six chickens in one hour time frame and, and gotten them all or six ducks, excuse me. Um, but I learned that that means I now have a brand new little duck flock. <laughs> I've got um, eight week old ducks now, but they will always be in the poultry netting mm-hmm. all year long. Like I'm not going to take the chance and have them all become eradicated again. So that was r- really a question for me. Like, is it going to work? when we do get the incremental snow that we get. Um, and so it may not actually be shocking, but it would at least be a barrier from predators. Yeah, it, it simply act as a net at that point. So what I would be doing, I'd be testing my fence each day, checking my voltage okay, um, and, and monitor it that way. So you want at least 3000 volts on your fence. So go out with your fence tester, check it each time you do chores. If you're getting below 3000 volts, I'd probably try and reset this fence, get it out of the snow. And then also probably keep in mind that depending how it's before performing for you and what kind of snow you're getting, I might even set up a fence outside of that, like a Posnick fence. That's like two or three strands that the coyotes are going to hit too. Okay. That way you don't have to worry about snow cover or dry conditions that point so that would be something to consider so they'll see that positive net or not positive they'll see that net that you've had up all year round and they've experienced it they know to stay away but even if they test it um just always keep power on it so hopefully they still get that sense of a tingle and then maybe even have an that outer action, perimeter have that outer out there too just okay as a potential it's kind of belt and braces at this point but yeah. Okay. Good to know. And then my next question about the netting is it, does there seem to be like a lifespan on it? Mm -hmm. Like at some point, you know, things are going to degrade down and you'll probably need to replace it. So they are UV treated. So, um, they shouldn't have any, um, degradation from that. So we have folks down in New Zealand and Australia that are using fences and they're doing fine. And they have, I know at least New Zealand has thinner ozone, so they're getting a lot more UV exposure. And they're holding up. Uh, we tend to get seven to 10 years out of them. And we've had customers that are using, say, 20 plus year old netting that they bought back in the 90s. So it depends how you handle it. If you're pulling it through brush and bramble and thorns, that's going to give you a shorter lifespan on the fence. If you have um, spikes anchored in hard soils and then you're trying to pull those out, but that soil had kind of dried around the spike. I'm doing hand gestures off screen to demonstrate that. Um, always happens on these calls. I talk uh, with my hands. You're good. Oh. You're a good company. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> oh, yeah. Lifelong learner and hand talker. There we go. Andrew Spirits there. And if, if that kind of spike's getting gotten glued down in the, oh, 
ground, it yeah. gets hard to pull out. So sometimes that spike pull out of the post, depending how hard it's been kind of glued into the ground. So oh, okay. I, I've had that recently. Um, that was actually on, um, yeah, that was in really, really hard soils that I got that in, but, okay. uh, but that so was my take... first, that was my first time I had second. it happen. Okay. But there, so there's things to consider like, okay, that might reduce its lifespan. But if I'm doing soft loamy Iowa soils, majority of the time, I'm not going to run into that. And if okay. I'm grazing my sheep pastures, which are nice grassy areas, I'm not pulling it through the same terrain that I'm going to be fencing my goats back here at Premier because we put that through what we call the thicket, put the goats out there because they like that spot. Not so much my nice, you know, sheep pasture. Yeah. No, the goats definitely tend to be better at the brush. Yeah. 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 The sheep or, or the cattle. Uh, how about the the lifespan of the solar, mm -hmm. your guys is specific, the solar batteries that, that run the poultry or that we have running the poultry netting? Mm -hmm. Um kind of what kind of seems to be the lifespan for those and again i'm sure there's variations but oh yeah um it, it's so the things that go out on the solar units i would say are probably the batteries and that comes down to management uh, okay. if you are setting your solar unit in the shade or putting it facing north so that panel is not really able to recharge that battery uh, that energizer is still going to pull power from that battery as long as it can. And if you pull too far down on these lead acid batteries, you hurt its ability to take a full charge or be recharged. So I think ideally we tend to get about two years out of a set of batteries. And I've had folks that have toasted them in a month because they um, face their panel to the north, let it get covered. So it just drew down on that battery. Okay. That's kind of what wears i guess there's you know, there's really not moving parts um yeah okay so mine my original one i think has got to be going on almost three years now mm -hmm. so i should I, I should feel pretty good about that <laughs> you should feel good um what okay. i would do is just have um oh you can have a multimeter or we have a fence tester and digital battery tester and just check your batteries periodically and make sure that uh they're above a i think it's a 12.6 voltage rating on these 12 volt batteries and okay. make sure they're above that and don't draw below that too often and they can last for it so just do some general checkup if they're getting okay. low just top them off um those those kinds of things help okay and is there any i guess like like do you guys have like a recycle program or anything like that or just you dispose of them like you would normally any type of of battery uh, I think if you go to your scrapyard, they'll take the lead acid batteries. I'm not okay. positive on that. I think it's going to vary region from region. Yeah, I know ours does. I just didn't know yeah. if, if you guys had a way of like, you know, send back the housing or, or you could just replace the battery itself, but keep your panel because it's not the panel oh. that's typically, it's just the battery inside, right? It's just not, the battery inside. Opens so up. Just replace that yeah, part. Yeah. Throw on yeah. a different battery. Yep. Okay. There we go. Your casing and your panel are still good. It's just yes. the battery itself. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, energizers don't really go bad. Uh, if you're in an area with a lot of ants, sometimes they try and get in there. So we've had folks that'll put ant repellent or poison in there in the case with them because okay. they're attracted to electronics. Uh, current boards on our units are potted, so that should prevent the ants from getting in there. But that had I've had had folks have that happen. It doesn't really seem to be a thing in Iowa. It must be further south, but I don't know if that's fire ants or what they're getting in there but yeah that's i haven't noticed we're pretty far north though i don't have yeah. a huge ant problem either i mean yeah. maybe your yeah. typical ones carpenter ants in the first few warm days of spring and then the little like i don't know i call them sugar ants i don't know what they actually are called technically but yeah okay well that's good to know so check them because you could have an ant an ant problem in certain locations well, I feel like you've definitely helped me with all of my poultry netting questions that I still had, but yep. you guys do more than just fencing, even though you have a really large, awesome, different fencing that's specific by animal. So if someone mm -hmm. has, you know, goat specific, you've got, you know, what's recommended best for the goats fencing section, et cetera, down by the livestock. We kind of talked about a lot about poultry, about how you could also use that for different livestock is more general overall. Um, but what else do you guys offer? Because obviously you have a huge farm 
there and a lot of experience with livestock. So mm-hmm. kind of share with us some of the other ways that Premier One can help folks with their livestock. Yeah, well, as you may have caught earlier, um, sheep's kind of the passion at Premier. So we have that 800 head U flock and uh, we carry a lot of equipment to uh, help that out. So hoof trimmers, mineral mixes, things of that nature. We we have a full sheep and goat equipment catalog. That's 100 plus pages of items along those lines. So if you're lambing or kidding, I, I uh, reach out to us, get a catalog and see what kind of things might help out on your farm. We also have a pol- we do a lot of poultry supplies, so feeders and waterers in addition to the chest of the netting. Uh, so another catalog for that. So there, there's more than just fencing on the Premier website. There's a lot of other equipment that we have. And then on the sheep side of things, again, uh, we, we run what's called a, a sheep advice service. Uh, it's also goat advice, but it started off as sheep advice. So we have a on-staff nutritionist um, that's a retired Iowa State uh, professor, Dr. Dan Morocle. And if you have any questions about, is this poisonous for my animal or... Uh, what should I be feeding in addition to whatever I have growing? Uh, if you're going for growth rate or you want better uh, lambing rates or kidding rates, uh, give us. we'll take any kind of questions. And we also have a um, uh, working with a veterinarian uh, for an actual sheep vet at a Pipestone, Minnesota area. And just send in those questions to uh, sheep advice at premier one supplies.com and we'll get you directed directly to those experts that do this every day. They know nutrition, they know veterinary questions because I hear a lot of folks saying, well, I ask my veterinarian, but they don't know sheep or there's not a veterinarian for a hundred miles that I can talk to. So uh, we can't do, we don't do scripts over the web, but we can get you pointed in the right direction and help you troubleshoot. So yeah. That's, oh, that's awesome. I did not, I was not aware that that was a service that you guys did. So that is mm-hmm. very cool. Yep. And for those of you who are going to be joining us at the Modern Homesteading Conference in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, in just a couple of weeks on June 30th mm-hmm. and July 1st this year, mm-hmm. Premier One's going to be there. Joe himself is going to be there and have his booth. Mm-hmm. So you will be able to come through if you've got additional questions, see some of the stuff up close and personal in action. And it's going to be a lot of fun. So, Joe, thanks so much for coming on. And oh, thanks for having me. Like I got a one-on-one consult on how to better <laughs> use uh, my poultry netting and expectations of that. So thank you so much. Always a pleasure. All right. Thank you. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that episode as much as I did. There was a lot jam-packed into there. And as always, we will have the blog post that accompanies today's episode. So if you are listening to this on your phone via a podcast app, you can go to melissaknorris.com forward slash three, nine, four, just the numbers three, nine, four, because this is episode 394. Of course, if you're watching this on YouTube, then you will see the link to that and other things that we spoke about in today's episode. You can access all of that at the blog post, and we'll just have that linked for you in the video description beneath this recording. I would love to know what other topics you would like to hear or questions you have to cover in future podcast episodes. So let me know in the comment section below this, if you're watching it on YouTube, or you can put that comment in a review. If you are catching this on whatever app you happen to be listening to. And if you're at the blog post, actually watching this from the website, there's always the comment section there as well. And I check all three places. So I look forward to seeing what you would like to hear in a future episode. Blessings in mason jars for now, my friends.